Okay, we're picking up. Um, <clears throat> fit 23 and I'm going to try and cover a lot today I know according to the syllabus we're supposed to finish Beowulf today uh, absent divine intervention probably not going to happen so Grindel's mother we left off jumps on Beowulf sits on him when he falls when he stumbles and we, we talked about at the very end, you know, somehow Beowulf gets up. Whether it's because Beowulf gets up and God decides that Beowulf should be victorious because Beowulf gets up or Beowulf gets up because God decides Beowulf should be victorious, it's a little unclear. But clearly God's involved and Beowulf's involved, right? Fit 23. He gets up, throws her off, and we're told, he saw among the armor a victorious blade, ancient giant sword, strong in its edges, worthy in battles. It was the best of weapons, except it was greater than any other man might even bear into the play of battle, good adorned the work of giants. The work of giants, into your work. We saw that phrase also in the Wanderer, describing, you know, the ancient decrepit city. It's our town, village, whatever you want to call it, okay? So he sees this big sword, okay? He draws it from the wall, and I think the implication is, you know, he grabs the hill, and in one movement, he swings, whether it's left to right or right to left, and kills Grindel's mother, okay? Kills Grindel's mother. And as soon as that happens, notice, we're told by 1570, the flames gleam. So the fire that is in the cave suddenly um, the fire that is in the cave suddenly kind of gets bigger. Notice, by the way, they talk about this. When, when Babel was brought into the cave, there's a fire there. There's a sword hanging on the wall. It's either hanging on the wall or stuck in the wall. What do those two things kind of show us? Let's say, possibly. Maybe I'm just being crazy here. About Grindel's mother. Why, why do you put something on a wall? What is that? If you put something on a wall. And I don't mean like the stupid argument. Bulletin board. Why do they put a bulletin board there when nobody can post it in there? It makes no sense. It's a decoration, right? It's some kind of ornamentation. It looks pretty. That tells us what about her? Your eyebrows just went. Well, I mean, it could be that she spends a lot of time in there. Okay, it could be she spends a lot of time in there. What else? Do bears, you know, decorate the inside of their dens? Do badgers decorate the inside of their holes? No. What's that telling you about her? Okay, she's not a bear, she's not a badger. What else? She's not just a monster. There is some kind of humanity or human aesthetic involved, all right? In fact, we're told, he looked around the chamber, passed by the wall, hefted the weapon hard by its hilt, okay? He wants to pay back Grindel and such. And he finds, you know, treasure and stuff. He finds Grindel and what does he do? Why does he cut off Grindel's head? Is this just desecration of the body? No. What's he going to do with the head? He takes it back to Hrothgar. What is Grindel's head proof of? First of all, Grindel's dead. <laughs> Here's the head. The rest of the body's dead. Okay. What else is it proof of? What is he offering it as proof of? 
Who else is dead? How is it proof that Grendel's mother's dead? It's not her head. How could I bring this back if I didn't kill her too? Okay, that's kind of the, the logic Beowulf wants us to accept. So he goes and kills Grindel's mother. He chops the head off Grindel, and we're told, like 1605b and following, the sword melts like icicles in the sun. So all that's left is the hilt. All right? We're not told why it melts. We're not told if it's because Grindel's blood is, is superheated or there's some spell. Nope. And we're told, line 1600. Let me back up. 1591. He chops off Grindel's head, and what immediately happens at the top of the mirror, the pond, the, the lake. If you were cinematically, if you're doing this, if you're filming this, you chop off Grindel's head and then fade to black, and then it's like, meanwhile, back at the top of the mirror, what do we see? That water starts to bubble. Almost like it's boiling. And what is coming up in the bubbling? Blood. Blood and gore. Okay. Notice what Hrothgar and his men assume. Soon the wise troops saw it. Those who kept watch on the water with Hrothgar, all turbid with the waves, troubled, sea stained with blood. Gray bearded elders spoke together about the good one, said they did not expect that nobleman would return triumphant to seek the mighty prince. In other words, Oh, there's Beowulf. He just bought it. And what do they do? To many it seemed that the sea wolf had destroyed him. Line 1600. The ninth hour came. The old English there, known dieth, the night of the day. What does that mean, the ninth hour came? It doesn't mean it's 9 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the evening. This is not Germanic. Let me rephrase that. This is not a or the Germanic way of reckoning time. This is the Judeo-Christian way of reckoning time. In the, in the Jewish tradition, you had first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour. Okay. And then you had evening prayers, midnight prayers, etc., vespers, and such. There were a total seven hours of the day for prayers. All right? One of those was the ninth hour. In the Gospels, the sixth hour is when Christ is crucified. The ninth hour is when he dies. It's at the ninth hour he gives up his spirit. It's at the sixth hour the sun goes dark, according to the gospel passion accounts. All right? Notice, they see all this, and the narrator tells us it's the ninth hour of the day. Now, as I mentioned, that's not, not Germanic language. That is not a Germanic way of courting time. So, if you're going to say... <clears throat> that the majority of the poem, you know, is pagan Germanic, and then some Christian comes and adds little things into it. This is one of those things that some Christian has to come add into it. If you're going to accept that early dating. If, however, the poem was composed in a later time period, 9th, 10th centuries, either the middle or the late date, then this is part and parcel of the whole poem. All right? Because what's happening? Notice, Rothbard's men are thinking what? He's dead. If they're thinking he's dead, then what they what do they think, possibly? Speculation here. What might happen next? Not the next moment, but that evening. They're back to square one. What happened two nights?
nights ago. Beowulf killed Grendel, right? The previous night, Grendel's mother came, killed Asherah, Hrothgar's most trusted companion, shoulder companion, fought with him in the war side by side. What happened three nights ago in four and five and six and seven and go back 12 years? Grendel came every night. So one night, Beowulf stopped that from happening. Then Grendel's mother came. Now Beowulf's dead, they think. The implication is, oh, we're back to that again. Right? But, we're told, the night hour came, the noble shielding abandoned the headland, and home went the gold friend of men, Crossgar. The guests, who are the guests? These are the geeks, these are Beowulf's men. They sat sick at heart and stared into the mirror. Because they're thinking, what? He killed him. Notice we didn't talk about this. What did Beowulf's men think the night they all bunked down in Herod, that their first night, the night that Grendel came? The poet tells us. They all thought what? We're going to die. We're all going to die. Okay. Why? Again, I betray my own bias. I don't think the quote unquote Christian stuff is added later. I think it is integral to the poem. And there's a reason why they think they're going to die. And that's because Beowulf is a Christ figure, he's not representing Christ. He's a savior figure. Well, look at the Gospels. What do the disciples think when Jesus says, i got to go to Jerusalem for this Passover? My time is at hand. My hour is up. We're told that Thomas says, doubting Thomas, Thomas says, we may as well go and die with him. Okay? They all think that they're going to die. Beowulf surprises them. Now, they all think he's dead. That's when the sword, meanwhile, back down at the bottom of the lake, <laughs> the camera takes us back down, and the sword starts to melt. And we're told, Beowulf then leaves the bottom of the mirror. He's got Grendel's head. He's got the sword hilt you know, stuck to his belt buckle or something, and he goes out and he dives up to get back up to the bottom, to the top of the lake. His men see him. They, you know, surround him with joy and such. And we're told, 1627, that splendid troop of, uh, 26, that splendid troop of thanes went towards him, thank God, rejoiced in their prince, that they might see him safe and sound. Then they help him take off his armor and such. And they take Grendel's head, and they all march back to Harrow. How many of Beowulf's men does it take to carry Grendel's head? Four. Four. Beowulf did it with one hand. Okay. How do you think they carried his head? Okay, first of all, how big is his head? We're not told, right? We don't get any kind of circumference or diameter or anything like that. How would they carry it? You know, each one grab a lock of hair. Because we do get this, you know, he's got some kind of strangely stringy hair. No. Most likely, the way they would carry it is they would each have a spear, and they would stick that spear up into the skull where the neck's been cut. So they're carrying it like this. It takes four men. So how heavy is this thing? These are warriors. They're not little wimpy, you know, white American boys. These are Chris Hemsworths, right? So they're all flexing, carrying this thing. Probably, let's go bare minimum, 50 pounds each, 200 pound head. If his head's 200 pounds, how big is the rest of Grendel's body? It's pretty big. Yeah, I think the thing is, on a 200-pound man, the head's going to be something like 10 or 11 pounds. 
So if it's 10 pounds, it's a 20. If his head's 200 pounds, then he's like two tons. Right? He's big, big boy, big strapping boy. Okay? So they make their way to Hera, and what do they do when they get there? Do they walk up to the, you know, where Hrothgar is sitting with holding the head up on the spears? Uh -uh. They put the head on the branch and they dragged it. Why? If you've ever seen, oh, it's a stupid movie. It's one of the Pixar, one of those. Um, Atrocity, Metro City. <sighs> Louder? Megamind. Megamind. What's the, the evil guy Megamind? What's he all about? What's most important? Presentation, right? This is Beowulf's presentation. He dragged Brindle's head in because what did that do to the nice, newly polished floors? Yeah, there's blood and gore and brains being dragged. Right? And we're told the women kind of go, oh. And Beowulf says, 1650 or so, look, son of Hapkane, prince of the Shieldings, we have brought you, notice we, again, it's not I, we, have brought you gladly these gifts from the sea, which you gave on here, a token of glory. Not easily did I escape with my life, but if God had not guarded me, Beowulf never takes sole credit. He always says, if God hadn't been for me, you know. And then he turns to, to Unfer. Sorry, your sword's a good sword, but it didn't do me any good. He says, but the ruler of men, 1661, granted to me so that I might see on the wall a gigantic old sword hanging glittering. He has always guided the friendless one, so I drew that weapon, right? He talks about killing her. And notice we're told, line 1666, I slew the shepherds of that house. I had a graduate student write her thesis. She actually wrote a dissertation, but she was only a master's student, so it was a master's thesis. On the use of the word, here done, throughout Beowulf. Because here it gets translated variously depending upon its context. It gets translated as king, guardian, protector, shepherd. Okay. And it's used for Hrothgar. It's used for Grindel's mother. Here it's used for Grindel's mother and Grindel. They are the guardians of that house. That house is essentially their kingdom. Okay. So the poet's kind of doing some interesting things there, equating, you know, Monsters with people and their own possessions and stuff. So, he says, I avenged the old Danes. Now you don't have to worry. The Grindelkin, they're all dead. Right? And Hrothgar then speaks. But he doesn't speak. We're told, 1687, Hrothgar spoke. But then he doesn't speak for 11 months. Yeah, it doesn't speak till 1700. 13 months. Instead, he examines the hilt, and we're told what he sees on the hilt. There was written the origin of ancient strife. When the flood slew rushing seas, the race of giants, they suffered awfully. What flood killed what race of giants? Noah's Ark. Among those killed in Noah's Ark were the, stop, the Nephilim. M is a plural ending, so it's the plurals of Nephilim. Well, who were the Nephilim? According to the Old Testament, according to Genesis, they were the offspring of when the sons of God went into the women of men. They were the giants produced by demonic, you know, seed, so to speak. Right? Or, that would make it Noah's flood, correct? Or, this is the Germanic flood myth. And the giants that were killed 
are the frost giants. Loki, you know, Laufey, etc. That was the people alien to the eternal war, the last reward, the ruler gave them, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and it also said who the sword was made for. Right? Then Hrothgar speaks. And hopefully, I'll get through all, all of this on one day because we really kind of need to move forward. This passage is usually just colloquially called Hrothgar's homily. What's a homily? Where do you go to hear a homily? You go to church. A homily is a sermon. It's also called Hrothgar's sermon. But that doesn't alliterate. So, Hrothgar's homily, it's old English, and I don't alliterate. And he says, One may indeed say, if he acts in truth and right for the people, remembers all, the old guardian of his homeland, that is all those things after one may say, all those things are informing us who the one is or should be. Anybody's going to tell the truth, anybody's going to remember his homeland, anybody's going to speak for his people should say what I'm now about to say. This Earl was born a better man. What kind of word is better? It's an adjective. You know, adjectives have three forms. You've got comparative, uh, or the basic form, comparative, and superlative. This is the middle one. Good, what's the next? Better, best. It's comparative. When you use better, what do you always have to use after it? Than, and the thing it's being compared to. So Beowulf is a better man than Whom? I think Rothgar is saying me. He's a better man than I am. Beowulf, my friend, your glory is exalted. Notice, is exalted throughout the world. How do we know that? What does he mean his glory is exalted throughout the world? It's not like Beowulf arrived back to the top of the mirror, somebody took a picture, boom, it went on Twitter. You know, it was everywhere. Uh-uh. So how is his glory already exalted? When word is first brought to Hrothgar that Beowulf has come, what does he say? That's not when he says, I knew him as a boy. That's when he says, I've heard stories about him. The, the seamen that have come bringing trade and tribute, They've been telling stories. So Beowulf is already famous. That's why Uther says, are you that Beowulf who? He's kind of implying there are other Beowulfs. Right? So he says, your glory is exalted throughout the world over every people. You hold it all with patient care. You temper strength with wisdom. <coughs> strength The Latin, fortitudo, with wisdom, sapientiae. A Beowulf scholar, an old English scholar in the 1960s, wrote an article about fortitudo and sapientiae as the controlling metaphor, if it's a metaphor, it might as well be, of Beowulf. Right? So he says, you temper this. With this, what does it mean to temper something? Like tempered steel. It's steel that you mix to make it stronger. So you strengthen this with this. Why? Because you can be really, really strong and dumb as a brick. Or you can be really, really wise and capable. Who have I kind of suggested? Apparently, is really, really strong, but dumb as a brick. Whose name might mean lack thought? 
Helak or Hijalak, Beowulf's uncle, who launches the Frisian raid. Why? Because he can. Okay. The one that I mentioned the first day when I started talking about Beowulf, you know, I mentioned the Book of Monsters, the Meteor Monstrum, and how Helak is mentioned in there because he's described as a giant. Kind of implies massive strength, but not a lot going on between the ears. So, he says, I'm going to fulfill our friendship as we've said. You shall become a comfort everlasting to your own people and a help to heroes. Problem there, he doesn't become a comfort everlasting to his people. He's a comfort for a long time, but not everlasting. And then Hrothgar brings up Haramon. Haramon is the example of the, if you want to put it, the anti-king, the bad king. He's the quintessential bad king image. He's referred to several times in the book. Don't be like Haramon. Why? Well, we're going to tell we're going to be told what he did. He grew not for their delight. Whose delight? The honor shieldings. That's Hrothgar's people. Haramon was a distant ancestor, right? No, he grew for their destruction in the murder of Danish men. Fourfold Germanic ethic. Duty to Lord, duty to kin, duty to avenge one's Lord. What's the Thane Lord relationship based upon? What does the Thane do for his Lord? Goes and fights battles, right? Brings the treasure, brings the booty back to the Lord. And then what does the Lord do? in return for that. He says here. <laughs> and he distributes the treasure back to the people who brought it to him. Okay? Not so was Haramon. He cut down his table companions, comrades in arms, until he turned away alone from the pleasures of men, the famous prince, the mighty God exalted him in the joys of strength and force. That is, a lot of fortitude, though. A lot of strength, a lot of power. Advanced him far over all men, yet in his heart he nursed a blood ravenous breast. <clears throat> he lacked wisdom. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honor. For their honor means to honor them. Kind of in return for what they've done for him. He endured joyless to suffer the pains of that strife a long-lasting arm to his people. Learn from him. Understand virtue. Notice, this is directed to Beowulf. He's just rid Herod of two monsters. And what does Hrothgar do? Don't be a bad king. What do you expect Hrothgar to say? He doesn't do that, however. I mean, he does offer him a little bit of praise, but then he undercuts that praise with this warning. Why? What can happen if all someone ever receives is just praise? <laughs> Get a little full of yourself. A little arrogant. You kind of start to think, well, I'm the smartest person there is. I'm the greatest leader there is, etc., etc. I don't do anything wrong. All right? And then... Rothgar kind of tells us a story, right? It's, it's an exemplar, a parable of sorts. It's a wonder to say, like 1724. Let me back up, 1723. For your sake I am telling this in the wisdom of my winters. For your sake, that is, for your benefit, Beowulf, I'm telling you this, and it's based on what? It's based on all my long years of life. The wanderer says, a man can't learn or know wisdom until what? Until he's lived a long time in this world. Okay? So here's the lesson he wants Beowulf to learn. <clears throat> it is a wonder to say, Almighty God, in his great spirit of lots of wisdom, land and lordship to mankind. That is, God says, here, you can have wisdom, I'll let you have land. I'll make you a king. 
He has control of everything. That is, God controls wisdom. He controls the land. He controls the lords. At times, he permits the thoughts of a man in a mighty race to move in delight. That is, what will please. Gives him to hold in his homeland the sweet joys of earth. A stronghold of men grants him such power over his portion of the world, a great kingdom. So he grants to somebody, you know, make the world fulfill your delights. He gives them power. He gives them a kingdom. And he gives that kingdom power and authority over a portion of the world. Kind of sounds like what at the beginning of the poem? Shield shivering. He threatened the neighbors. He denied them of their meat benches. He extended his kingdom, etc. Right? So that he himself cannot imagine an end to it in his folly. In other words, the person who is granted all these things, Grothgar says, starts to think what? It's always going to be like this. This will never change. And we're back at what idea? This idea that this is how things are, and this is how they're always going to be. See, when I brought up the idea of change earlier in those lines, 168 through 178 and such, or 175 through 188, about never expecting change and being thrust in the fires and place, etc. The change isn't just change for the better. It's change. Things becoming the opposite of what they are. So, this guy, the guy who has everything going wonderfully for him, give me an example of somebody today. doesn't have to be a political leader. Who seems to have it all? Name somebody. Does Joe Biden have it all right now? Is everything going swimmingly for Joe? No. His presidency, you know, it's going through the tank. Elon Musk, things are going pretty well for all of you, right? SpaceX, flights are doing well. He's back to being the richest person in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jeff Bezos has things going pretty well. Bill Gates, yeah, until the stuff about Jeffrey Epstein kind of came out and his wife divorced him, and, but he was, you know, doing pretty well. People would say. They think what the speaker is saying. Everything's going to keep going wonderfully. He dwells in plenty. In no way plague him illness or old age, nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit. Okay? So the individual, the speaker saying, is young and healthy. He's not even thinking of illness. Evil thoughts don't come into his mind, nor any strife or sword. Nobody's challenging him. This guy's a king. He's a war leader. Hate shows itself, but all the world turns to his will. Right? This guy is in total control. He knows nothing worse. And then we're told, at last his portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. Notice, the portion of pride, that is, the bit of pride God gave him does what? It grows and flourishes. It becomes more than what he was given. And the implication is it becomes super pride. Or what the Latin fathers called superbia. Arrogance, hubris, the kind of pride that comes before fall, the kind of pride that's used in the old English poem, um, Battle of Malden, that I've mentioned before, over Malden, the kind that that character Birtnoff has. And by the way, that phrase, over mode, other than Birtnoff, it's only used in reference to one other person in all old English literature. Satan. And it's used multiple times. But it's used about Satan. Right? 
So, his pride grows and flourishes while the guardian sleeps. What's the guardian? What's the thing in you that supposedly keeps your pride in check? What do we call that faculty today? What makes you not do something that you want to do, that you know you shouldn't do? Your conscience. They had no word for the conscience in Anglo-Saxon. They called it the soul's guardian, or the soul's warden. The guardian sleeps, the soul's shepherd, there's that word again, the shepherd, the king, the guardian, the protector, the savior, etc., of the soul. That sleep is too sound. In other words, it's too deep. Just like in the poem, the Danes sleep is too deep every night that Grindel comes. Right? Bound with cares, the slayer too close, who, sinful and wicked, shoots from his bow. And you've got a footnote. The slayer is center of ice. The soul's guardian is reason, conscience, or prudence. Right? The slayer is sin or vice. Could be. The slayer could be something else, though. Because look at the language that's used. Then he is struck in his heart, under his helmet, with a bitter dart. Read St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 6, I believe it is. About putting on what's called the whole armor of God. And St. Paul mentions the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate, what does it cover? The heart. And what does it do? In Ephesians, Paul says, it puts out the fiery darts of the wicked one. The word that's used here for bitter can also be translated fire. In other words, we might have a biblical illusion right here. Right? He knows no defense. Why? Because the conscience has been dulled. It's asleep. The person has no defenses against these thoughts. And it's the thoughts enter the heart. That strange, the strange dark demands of evil spirits. What he has long held, notice, now seems too little. Why does it seem too little? Because his portion of pride, which let's say was supposed to be, I'm ruler of this, now says what? But I want this too. Oh, and while I'm at it, I'm going to take, in fact, the room is going to take the whole thing. It's all mine. Right? He was given this, but this suddenly is what? Not enough. I'm not saying this, I'm not implying anything morally about Jeff Bezos, all right? Don't, don't get me wrong. But it's akin to Amazon moving into what new area that it's moved into? Anybody know? Pharmaceuticals. So you can get your prescriptions filled via Amazon. It's not enough, you know, that you can buy daily things, etc., and get them delivered within two hours. Healthcare. What's going to come after healthcare? I mean, they're already in the grocery business, Whole Food, you know, and opening Amazon stores in Seattle. They're going to roll out, etc., across the country. It's more and more and more, etc. <clears throat> so, what he has long held seems too little, angry and greedy. He gives no golden rings. Why? Because he's greedy. It's mine. I'm not going to distribute. Sounds an awful lot like who that was just mentioned. Haramud. For vaunting boasts, he gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts. 
And his final, final destiny, he neglects and forgets. What's his final destiny? What is everybody's final destiny? Death. 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 Notice, his final destiny, he neglects and forgets. What's the difference between neglect and forget? Okay. How so? I mean, I think you're right. He knows, but he doesn't pay any attention to it. Okay. There's a scene in Hamlet. It's in the fifth act. Hamlet's getting ready to have his, his jousting match, so to speak, his, fit, his fencing match with the character Laertes. And he's got a bad feeling in his gut. And his friend Horatio says, then don't go through it. I mean, if you've read any Shakespeare, Hamlet, then you should know. If you've got a bad feeling about something, you don't go through it. He goes, now I'm going to go through with it. And he says, if it is not today, it'll be tomorrow. If not for tomorrow, it will be today. The readiness is all. What's the readiness? Hamlet is saying, you have to be ready today for death to come. All right? And since he neglects and forgets, since God, ruler of glory, has given him a portion of honor. Notice, God has given him a portion, a dealing, an amount of honor. What's the implication of that? It's not his on his own. That is, it's not something he has created for himself. Just as it has been given, it can be removed. I've mentioned the book of Job in here. Job says, shall we not receive evil as well as good from God? No. So what happens? In the end, it finally comes about that the, there's that word again, the lone life, the land of life. Dwelling start to decay and falls. The life dwelling, that's this stuff. It's the body. It gets old and it starts to fall apart. And what happens? Fated to die, another follows him who doles out his riches without regret. That is, the old guy died having become a hoarder of everything. And the new person who's king does what? Opens up the storehouse and starts giving all the treasure away. Defend yourself from wickedness, dear Beowulf. Best of men. Choose better. And then he qualifies better. Eternal counsel. So if eternal counsel is better, what's it being compared to? Here. Choose eternal advice. Choose eternal counsel. Be, you know, elf read. Elf advised. Supernaturally advised. All right? The glory of your might, care not for pride, great champion. The glory of your might is but a little while. Too soon it will be what's going to happen. In other words, Beowulf, you're where right now? You are on top of the world. Right? I mean, this is like he just won every event in the Olympics. Everybody looks at you. Beowulf, Beowulf, Beowulf. And he said, well, what's going to happen tomorrow? Too soon it will be that sickness or the sword will shatter your strength. Or the grip of fire. So, you're going to get sick. You're going to get killed. You're going to get burned alive. You're going to die in a flood. Or let's go back to the martial or the cut of a sword or the flight of a spear or terrible old age. Notice two of the things that Hrothgar really wants to emphasize. You're going to die in battle or you're going to be lonely and old. Or the light of your eyes will fail and flicker. 
And I can't help but wonder if Dylan Thomas had this in mind. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of blood. You know, go out fighting. In one fell swoop, death, O oh warrior, will overwhelm you. Pretty good homily, right? I mean, if you're exhorting somebody to not think of only the here and now. But then Hrothgar does something that you don't usually hear a preacher do. He brings it all down to the very personal. Thus, a hundred half years, I held the ring dance. That is, for 50 years, I ruled the days how. What's the thus mean? Just like the guy I just described. I had everything. kept them safe from war from many tribes throughout this middle world. That is, for 50 years I ruled and we were in total peace. From spears and swords so that I considered none under the expense of heaven my enemy. For 50 years I didn't have any enemies. Those people, those neighboring, uh, you know, surrounding nations, they were what? For Hrothgar, or to Hrothgar. They were tributes. So that when he said, hey, you know, I want to build a big old house. Call it Harrod. What did those people do? Yes, sir, Mr. Hrothgar, how big do you want to build this house? And how much gold and silver do you need for it? Look, turnabout came in my homeland. What's another word for turnabout? Change. For 50 years, I had everything going. And then suddenly, change. Grief after gladness. When Grendel became my invader, ancient adversary. For that persecution, I bore perpetually the greatest heart tears. When did Grendel come? After he ruled for 50 years. So, 50 years... Grindel came for how long? 12 years. So that's 62 years. Hrothgar's been king. Right? How old has he been? He's probably, bare minimum, 80 years old at this point. Okay? Go back for a moment. Rothgar says, I knew him being but a boy. Talking about Balaam. When did he say he knew him? When I was new in my kingdom. When was he new in his kingdom? Okay, maybe he's not talking about like the day after I you know, ascended to the throne. Maybe it was in the first five years. Well, let's say it's the first five years. Then he knew Beowulf being but a boy 57 years ago. Let's say Beowulf was five years old. That makes Beowulf how old now? 62. Kind of makes sense then when you hear Beowulf say something like, in my youth I did these things. Doesn't make sense when you hear the narrator talk about the youths sitting together, Beowulf and the other two. Unless you think of Beowulf in connection to Rothgar. Believe me, you think I'm old, but 60 or 62 is nothing compared to 80. Pretty much you get up there and they all merge together. Right? But if I'm correct, and let's say Beowulf is 62, or let's go with 57, he's then going to rule for 50 years. So when he fights the dragon, Beowulf, over 100 folks. Why is that significant? Not one of us. Beowulf is a type. He represents something. This isn't to be taken in a kind of a literal human, this is history kind of 
the way a lot of scholars and critics before Tolkien read the poem. Right? And we've even had scholars and critics in the last 30 years kind of demythologizing, demarvelizing Beowulf, trying to explain away the seemingly supernatural stuff. Like, you know, it took him the better part of a day to jump, to get down to the bottom. No, no, it just means that, you know, it took him a long time. Well, a long time if you're holding your breath, depending upon your lung capacity, two minutes, three minutes, not better part of a day. We're going to hear a story later on where, you know, Beowulf swam home after the fishing raid, holding 30 suits of armor in one arm. So that means he's dog paddling across the Baltic Sea. Not he didn't actually swim. He was in a boat, and he rode. Why? Because it makes it no longer, quote, unquote, miraculous. It makes Beowulf just a really buff warrior, you know, to do it, to do it that way. So, thanks be to the Creator, the Eternal Lord, that I've lived long enough to what? To see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. In other words, thanks be to God that I lived long enough to see a change, to experience a change. Right? Is this the kind of thing you expect to hear after Baal kills Grindel and Grindel's mother? It's kind of, you know, it's a little jarring because what do they hear after he kills Grindel? We hear the Finsburg. Which is all about what? Feud. This is kind of about feud, but its emphasis is on wisdom. He's saying, Beowulf, you got strength and spades, man, but you temper that with this. Okay. And he's suggesting, don't lose this. Don't trust only in your strength. Has Beowulf ever said anything that implies he does trust only in his strength? Who does he always, every time so far, give credit to? God and my strength. Interestingly, when we get the dragon fight, just before the dragon comes, we're told the dragon destroys Beowulf's own hall. This is after Beowulf has ruled for 50 years. 50 years of peace, 50 years of prosperity, no warfare. So no warf warfare means his men haven't actually fought any battles. They don't know actually what a battle involves. They do war training, right? Word is brought to him that a dragon has destroyed his house, and we're told Beowulf immediately assumes one thing. He anchored God. He did something that went against, against what God wanted. Kind of interesting that he does that. Right? So, what happens? Beowulf says, we want to go home. Your, your Grindel problem is all done. Right? That one day. Your Grindel problem is all done. Fit 26, he says, we want to go home. And he tells Hrothgar, if you have any problems, all right, if, if your sons are ever in danger, line 1829, I will bring you a thousand things, heroes, to help you. I have faith in Helak, the Lord of the Geats, though he be young. Is this a young person talking about another young person? It, to me, it sounds like Beowulf is saying, I'm older than he is. You know, he'll, he'll do the right thing, even though he's a young guy. Kind of implying, you know, he's a little green, maybe. Shepherd of his people will support me with words and deeds, and I might honor you well and bring to your side a force of spears, the support of my might. If ever Hrothric, son of a prince, decides to come to the Gatish court, he will find many friends. Hrothgar says, God gave you those words. Thank you. And then he tells them, we'll stop with this. Line 1855. You have brought it about that between our peoples, the Gatish nation and the Spear Danes, 
There shall be peace, and strife shall rest. The malicious deeds they endured before. See, when Beowulf and his men arrived, and the, the Coast Guard said, who are you guys? And Beowulf said, we're made of the geats. There's a reason why the Coast Guard is a little leery about them. They're in conflict. Right? Beowulf, according to Hrothgar, bridges, resolves that conflict. He says, you have brought peace between our two peoples. The malicious deeds of the past, they're gone. In other words, the feud of sorts has been resolved. Right? And he goes, and I'm going to give you all kinds of treachery. All right, we'll stop there. We will pick up when we come back. Um, probably around fit 28. And we're going to skip a bunch. I know, probably not nearly enough. But.